Um, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Um, after two defeats since the restart of the Premier League, um, Arsenal are in 10th place and even further away from Champions League qualification. Um, what needs to improve at the club and how long will it take for Arsenal to become successful again? Um, if you are new to our channel, um, please subscribe to us and follow us on, on social media and leave your comments in the uh, comment section uh, below. Um, we're joined today by James Rowe. He's a writer for World Football Index and he's a regular on, uh, on TalkSport, TalkSport 2, and he's appeared on some fan cams for AFTV. Um, well, James, uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us today, mate. Um, we'll just start off right out of the gate. Um, so what, what needs to change at Arsenal um, for them to be you know, challenging for the Premier League uh, and even just qualifying for the Champions League? Evening, guys. First and foremost, thanks for having me on. Um, if I can start with that question by saying... Uh, uh, new owners would be nice. Uh, owners to actually have Arsenal as the priority number one. Because at the moment, I feel under Kroenke that we are quite clearly not his priority. If you compare to the investment he does with the LA Rams and how he appears to be really on top of everything going on stateside with the, I think the LA Rams reached the Super Bowl as well and constructing a new stadium and he appears to be heavily involved and, and wants success for the LA Rams but doesn't appear to want to have the same level of success at Arsenal. It just appears to for it to be a cash investment which is kind of rolling on and, and also I think maybe jobs for the boys at board level where Arsenal in the past, especially in my 30-odd years of supporting the club, I always had custodians at the club at board level that had the, the interest of the club and the welfare of the club was the most important thing. And that really appears to have fallen away. And, and if it starts at the top and kind of trickles down to the hierarchy of what is now an extremely inexperienced manager and also players that are not as good as what they think they are. And Arsenal have paid an awful lot of money to secure the services of those players and these are players that appear to be happy to earn a wage, happy to live in London, but don't want to, to give themselves for the course to be successful for Arsenal long term. So, very strange times indeed. Absolutely. What about you, Ryan? Yeah, I echo what James has said there. Um, I think the interest and welfare, you know, has, you know, that needs to change. I mean, it's changed since David Dean left the club. <laughs> You know, it needs to start at the top. Um, I don't think we've got the wrong manager. I think Arteta's going to be a good manager in time. But, you know, at the end of the day, without quality investment, you know, we're going to spar out control because we need to sort the defence out. So I think you're, you're completely right, James. It all starts from the top. And Lou, what would you reckon, mate? Um, I think, like, over the years, I think it's kind of become apparent that it's obviously at the board level because, obviously, from when, obviously, we moved from Highbury to the Emirates, you know, I think, obviously, a lot of fans are under the impression that we're going to have a, a tough time, you know, with budget's going to be tight, we'll allow for that. We've moved there, you know, we still sort of had that period where we didn't have the money we paid off the stadium and then we were sort of under the impression that, okay, well, maybe it's the money now we can invest to keep up with the better clubs in the league. And it's kind of proven that that really hasn't been the case. And then we've kind of looked at the manager and now we've sort of found well, we've gone through a couple already. So it seems to be like that, you know, we've exhausted every logical possibility that, that you would go down to sort of find out where the problem lies. And then it, we kind of left now with, um, with it looks like it's definitely the top. And especially after sort of, you know, you'd have Wenger who seems to be a little bit of a gatekeeper. You know, he kind of was one of those guys that seemed to, allow himself to take some of the blame on behalf of his players and the board and stuff. And then sort of since he's gone and Gazidis as well, it's kind of seems to now be a little bit more an open, you know, to sort of see where the strings really are being pulled from. So um, I think, yeah, something like, like James said, obviously it's clear that Arsenal are always a profitable club and, and making a good amount of money. And obviously that money seems to have been siphoned off to other interests, which uh, is not what you want to hear as an English football fan, is it? That uh, a foreign consortium is, is siphoning off all the, all the profits they're making and reinvesting it in, in their, in their, you know, big global sports brand in the States. Well, any, any fan, mate, no matter, yeah. where, no matter where you're based, you don't, you want, you want an owner that's invested not only financially, but emotionally at some level in, in the club. 
Um, yeah. mm. There's plenty of examples. Man United with the Glazers, my team West Ham with uh, David Gold, David Sullivan. You kind of think, well, you know, if they're not, you know, invested in, in the club so much, then, you know, there's no room for uh, pro- for progress, really. Um. So what? So for you guys, I mean, how, how far would you say this decline has, has been going for Arsenal? Um, I mean, is it is it unfair to say um, it goes back to even go even moving to the Emirates? Is that is that too harsh to say? It's it's, it's been on a decline since then. For me personally, I think it was the start of the decline. Um, don't get me wrong; it's the bigger picture. I, I don't regret going to the Emirates. I do miss Highbury, um, but. From a business point of view, I see why it had to be done. But you think about it, you know, from Wenger's era, from 96 to, you know, 2006, the first 10 years, that's not mm. that's not talk about the last 10 years, but the first 10 years were incredible. Mm. You know, um, two doubles, you know, the Invincibles, and then 2006, unlucky in the Champions League final. Um, and then, obviously, there was the start of the decline, which I do understand because, you know, they had to sell a lot of the best players because of finances. And I think a lot of the fans probably supported Wenger for the first five, maybe seven years, because we kind of, I think I was quite patient with it. I, I was gutted that we lost to people like Birmingham City in the League Cup final, etc. But I think now it's changed. I think we would never expected Arsenal to be struggling to be 10th. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a different era now. And I think it's gone too far the other way. And I think if it was going to go this way, I'd have wanted to stay at Highbury. So it's, um, it's a, it's, it almost feels like Arsenal, because we talk about what's good about Arsenal. Well, we seem to develop good young players and, you know, from nothing and then sell them on for a great profit. And that's a brilliant achievement, but it doesn't really do anything for us fans, does it? Hmm. I think that's what Arsenal have become now. We've become a team that develops young players, and but we haven't really got the killer instinct anymore. Mm. What about what about you then, Lou? What, how long do you think this decline as a club Arsenal has been going on for? Yeah, I'd agree with Ryan in that sense. Like, if you've got to look at the sort of that barren sort of era we had after so much success, it kind of you know confirms that things were weren't where they should be. But like you say, I think uh, most Arsenal fans would probably say, you know, we'll kind of put up with it because we've got this end goal in sight where, you know, money should be freely available and things like that. So it definitely does seem the sort of the, the move to the Emirates kind of signalled the start of a downturn, you know, with the finances and then obviously losing our best players. And I think also we started to shift our identity, didn't we, as well? We took more of that sort of Spanish flair and technician sort of players as well. When when we lost all the all the Vieiras, you know, and all the defenders like Campbell and Keown and all, you know, all that the, the sort of the big old school alpha male types. And we went for more technicians and we started getting playing that lovely football. I think we've always played lovely football. I don't ever think we were aesthetically unpleasant to, to watch as a team. When we have our moments, I think we were up there. But um, yeah, it just seems that we, we seem to have lost our way when we when we did the move between the stadiums. And then obviously kind of, like you say, you look at Wenger's era and it's just as long of sort of, a barren period as there was the success at the start, you know, so um, it kind of shows that it was a consistent decline. It wasn't like we had, you know, one or two seasons that were great, one that was terrible. It kind of seems to have flatlined a little bit in one direction, maybe. And what about you, James? Well, I think Ryan makes a great point in particular about it going too far the other way. I think he's, he's made, made, makes an excellent point about that. I remember going to Highbury for a, a game against Aston Villa and on the front of the programme was the like um, the miniature um, mock-up arch- architecture of what the new stadium is going to look like and you've got Hillwood and Wenger shaking hands and there was positivity that day when the kind of move had been like kind of... Um, classified that it was going to happen and I think if you was to fast forward to what it was it what it, it's actually become it's a lot different to what everybody thought it was going to be I mean obviously there's TV problems when going to a new stadium and getting used to it every club that moves to a new stadium experiences that regardless of level but I think as well in terms of player recruitment there's there's completely different characteristics to the first 10 years as uh 
of players under Arsene Wenger in the last 10 years. And I think Arsene Wenger in the cases, I think he got very stubborn towards the end where I think from his point of view, it was important to be right. But yeah. that, that's, not what it's, that's not what it's about, is it? It's about time. I mean, I've spoken to enough professional players and managers who tell me that timing is extremely important in football. Timing of a new manager coming in, timing of a um, new players coming in or a new wind of change coming through the club. And we just pe- appear at the moment to be in a state of flux. I mean, I've often been um, championing how important youth is, but I also wanted to let um, Arsenal players know. I um, One of my recent interviews was with uh, Charlie Gilmore, who left Arsenal as recently as last summer. And he he signed for Norwich and then he went subsequently on loan to Telstar here in the Netherlands. And I spoke to him, I think, at the beginning of March, I think it was. And um, he said something really, really interesting. He said that when you are an Arsenal youth player from a very young age, everything is handed to you on a plate. You have the best youth coaches. You go to the best tournaments around the world. You make use of the best facilities. And when you leave the club, you think... Um, not in an arrogant sense, but when he left the club, he thought that they're going to be he's going to have lots of different options, and he did have options, but maybe not as many as what he thought he was going to have. And he told me the reason why that was is because in the Premier League and in the Championship, for example, although young players come from a, a kind of qualified youth academy or a youth academy with status, they don't necessarily want to take a chance on on a young on a young boy in a man's game when they know they need points, they know they need to progress. And I just think at the moment, Arsenal have got some good young players coming in. And as I said before we started recording, it seems that a specific younger generation of Arsenal fans, I mean, I respect the opinion of every gooner, young and old, but I I get the impression that a younger generation, they're only looking at the price tag and they're saying, oh, he's only worth £15 million. He must be rubbish, you know. Take a look at what he can actually do. I mean, I've seen Arsenal fans advocating for uh, £50 million for a new centre-half in the summer. I mean, obviously, we're in the midst of a global pandemic where safety is the most important thing. And you've had some countries that have struggled to get... um, protection and I look at we've got the likes of Daniel Ballard in our youth setup along with Zach Medley as well there is no harm in bringing those two into the first team into the first team squad and subsequently first team next season because the the biggest challenge going forward for Arsenal in these strange times we have to learn to build a spine we have to learn to build a spine of players where it might sound cliche where you can actually predict seven of the 11 that's going to start. You, you could name what the spine was going to be. Like years ago, when we had the likes of uh, Seaman Adams, Vieira, Berlachkamp, and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, we've got to take it in very, very small steps. It's going to take a long time, but we've just got to take it, I know it might sound cliche, but game by game and day by day as well. In terms of the investments, obviously, you know, Stan Kroenke, you know, Silent Stan, he's been, you know, criticised for, you know, the investments or sort of lack of investments in in the playing squad. Um, But in terms of the investments that have been made last few seasons, they just simply haven't been as good as, say, you know, Liverpool, Man City. And that's why them two have been at the top last few seasons. You look at Shokram Mustafi, 35 million. um, And, you know, Nicola Pepe was a lot of money. He's not quite settled. So, there has been some investments made, but not as good as, as the other side. So um, I, I was reading on the, uh, the Athletic today, with, um, written by David Ornstein, who's obviously very well in the known. Um, I think it's going to be like a sort of transfer committee, a bit like how Liverpool and, and City work. Um, and it'd be like Arteta with Edu, who's the technical director, as well as um, the other sort of board members. So do you think that's um, a, a better way of... Uh, of working than it has been previously. We've we've made some investment in big players, like we've spent money. You know, when you look at our sort of front line, there's some world class players there, and you know, we and we seem to have, like you say, with Pepe as an example, spent 72 million on a player that a lot of people might argue like it wasn't necessarily a position we needed to fill when we could have reinvested that into a defence rather than sort of bring in players that obviously you know towards the twilight years of their career. Um, for me personally, I and this kind of leads back onto onto what you were saying, James. I, I really like what Leipzig have done, and mm. 
I, I would be really intrigued to sort, sort of see what we could do investing in younger players. Because we've seen, like, for example, May United, they spend over $100 million every year, but they're still no closer to top four. So mm-hmm. spending hundreds of million is not necessarily a guarantee, is it, of, of success? It seems to be Liverpool, for example, might spend, what, they spent $90 million, didn't they, on um, their keeper? after when they were sort of close, but no cigar, so to speak. And, and that was a great investment. And they spent 75 on um, uh, right. Van Dyke. Yep, thanks, Bill. You know, they seem to have invested a lot of money, but on one or two players to sort of cement their formula. Um, hmm. was, I, I would be, and obviously you being in the Netherlands, James, as well. Um, Ajax in particular seems to have this amazing grassroots thing in Dutch mm. football. Um, I've got a friend that regularly goes to, to Holland and he goes to watch like the under 13s and stuff like that. Mm. And he just does it because he enjoys it and he likes seeing the setup and how they bring him through. You know, what, what's in your experience, like what seems to be so good about, for example, the Netherlands in particular bringing a resurgence and could we take a model like that and what Leipzig have done with his younger talents and give him a chance and, and try and do something that way to build a spine rather than, mm. you know, kind of keep trying to plug holes with big transfer fees. Is, is that something mm. that could be done or? It could be done, but it requires patience. Um, in the case of Ajax, um, education is key education on the pitch, education off the pitch. I've spoken to enough Ajax players who now play at different clubs and they have said the education they received was nothing short of extraordinary. And the education of the, the Ajax model, it's um, it, the youth set up is the lifeblood of the club. When one person leaves, the door opens for another one. And the key components are, is when they are ripe enough to reach the first team, they are given a, a sustained experience in their natural position. They are given support by their manage, uh, management and backroom staff, their teammates and the fans. I mean, I've been, I've been watching Ajax first hand for more than a decade and the, the, the rapturous applause when someone comes on to make their debut is as loud as it's ever been. Even for the players that are, are maybe not, they're not, maybe not the Kleiverts or um, Berkamp and, 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 and people of that ilk, for example. But they are, it's the lifeblood of the club and the education they receive in terms of tactical um, meetings, being aware of space, being aware of the ball, respecting your teammates as well. I mean, I remember speaking to uh, Lars Kalema, who also played for um, Groningen, and he's currently playing in Denmark. And he said to me that in his youth, he would go to train at Ajax, at the, at the youth setup, and it kind of consumes your entire youth. You kind of have moments where you don't get to see your friends and you think, oh, you know, that's my teenage years have kind of like passed me by a little bit. But it, he went on to become a, a professional footballer. But it, it would require patience as well. And I, I don't think Arsenal fans, specifically the younger generation, I don't think they have the patience for that. I think they would much rather, although I disagree, they would much rather look at the price tag. And for example, the Hyper Bowl when Pepe signed, we didn't need a winger, but you go out and spend 80 million on a winger and you pay installments of 20 million euros and they, that, the installments still have to be paid. And then you've got people looking at what um, Ozil, for example, you've got people tweeting and looking about what he'd done for his previous club, Real Madrid, and also um, the German national team upon which he's retired. And, it's all about the here and now. The here and now is the most important thing. And we've always had a good crop of youth players coming through, particularly in the late 80s as well. And it's an opportunity now. I mean, I really hope that, that Ballard gets an opportunity. I saw Emil Smith Rowe last season in the game at home to Sporting Lisbon when he played very well. He's currently under the tutelage of an excellent manager in Danny Cowley. So I'm sure he's improved from that. And Ketty has played under Biel, so he's, so as, as such a fantastic reputation. I mean, if you think of the big Argentinian names that BLs have brought through, you know, that have gone on to become household names in Argentina and, and around the world, it was BLs that gave them uh, their chance. And I think it was a little bit of an oversight from Arteta to to bring Nketiah back because 
when you go out on loan, it's like the last part of learning your trade and learning the responsibility of what it means to play for um, to play for a big club. And I remember speaking to uh, Jordi Davos, who's currently at Hull City, and he came through the youth setup at PSV. And I mean, he went on loan to Excelsior Rotterdam. And he said to me, he said, I come from PSV where the facilities were amazing. He said, but I'm all of a sudden in the changing room with other men who are fighting for bonuses to stay in the Eredivisie to be able to pay their mortgages and, and do nice things in life. So it kind of really made him a man very quickly. And I think it's definitely something that we can look at, but it would require an awful lot of patience from Arsenal fans. Yeah. I completely agree with you, James. And I think as well, looking at that, it's a balance. And I think it is important to, you know, it's important for player growth and, mm. and look at developing young players. And, it, and I do understand how we haven't also got the patience in terms of, you know, look at the price tag. Mm. Um, and I think there's nothing wrong with, you know, spending, you know, 50 million plus for high profile players, but in the right areas. Like you mm. say, why spend money on people? Or, or, I like Pepe, by the way, but why spend money on those kind of players when you've got to look at what's failing Arsenal at the mm. moment? It's a defence. You know, I don't mind if they spend 100 million on one player if it's the right defender. Mm. You know, we, we haven't addressed, let's be honest, we've not had a great defensive midfielder since we era, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, um, you know we've not had the, the the solid back four for a long time, so mm. that's where we need to. If we're going to spend big, surely that's got to be where they address it. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to mention that, Ryan. Actually, I mean, in terms of the positions on the pitch, I mean, obviously defence has been spoken about, but apart from the defence, where else needs to be strengthened on the pitch, and perhaps even more importantly, what characters do they need in that dressing room? I think it's a balance. I think, you know, I think we do need experienced players, but I also think it's like Jamie Carragher said, sometimes experience is, is a myth. You know, just because someone's been playing for over 20 years doesn't mean to say that they're great. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think it's, you've just got to get someone who can lead the team, you know, and I don't see any leaders with Arsenal at the moment. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I think our, we've got Aubameyang, who's our captain, and you could argue he's a leader because he's a great player, but, we need some, we just need a back four. And I don't know if we'll ever get, you know, your Winterburns, Tony Adams anymore. We'll never get the classic, you know, Arsenal. But we were always known as boring, boring Arsenal, weren't we? The George yeah. Graham days. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying we have to go back to those days, but at the same time, we just need some experience. We just need quality people at the back that are solid. They're not, you know, a show-offs or anything like that. We just need to, but it's not just the defence, it's a defensive midfielder. We need a strong almost like a Yaya Toure character in his prime, you know? We, we need yeah. something there to just hold it and keep it together because we've got great strikers, we've got great wingers, we've got great bit players, but we haven't got central players that are going to be strong in their roles. I think even with our wingers and our midfielders, they're not necessarily... They're always rotated, aren't they? They're, mm. they're never, like, you never know what their firm positions are. I mean, that's just mm. me. I could be wrong, but... I don't really feel like, and it's not Arteta's fault, He's, I think he's going to be a great manager, but I just don't feel the players really know exactly you know, where their best position is. Mm. I mean, what do you think on that, James? Well, no, I think, I agree. And I think as well, with um, a settled back four, it's not, it's not so much the names, it's the fact of a back four playing three, to five, games, three yeah. to five games consecutively three to five games consecutively learning about space learning about when to move when not to move and it's about finding a settled back four and we haven't had that for quite some time and you know you, where you could almost use a ruler and, and put a put a line it was so straight you mentioned Yaya Torre to think he was one he was once on trial at Arsenal yeah, to think that, that he he was one <laughs> He was once on trial at Arsenal and went to Beveren in Belgium. And this is, this is what I mean. I mean, people seem to think that they look at big, big names, but the likes of, I saw Kuli Bali linked with Liverpool today. I'm, I'm, maybe in, many people do not know. Kuli Bali used to play in Belgium for Schenk. Kuli Bali played part of his career playing in Belgium as an unknown defender. And look where he is now. 
And so this is why scouting is also very important. And, and it's not just about a scouting report as to ticking boxes as to, oh, he does this and he does that. But look at the character of a player. Look at his previous, look at his injury record, look at the characteristics. Because these are all the things that you want. I mean, it's just about scouting properly and, and coming away from the names. I mean, look at, look at Sheffield United. Sheffield United have uh, John Fleck, who was a free transfer from Coventry City. They had the likes of uh, Basham and I believe O'Connell, who were playing in League Two and League One, um, League One, sorry, and Championship level. And they're motivated by a tremendous manager. And these are, they're now Premier League players and they don't look out of place. So people, Arsenal fans in particular, need to come away from the names. It's not, it's, it's not names, it's character. And we need to build that character. I mean, Ryan makes a great point about George Graham. I remember those days. I was a very young boy, but we actually won a European trophy. Yeah. And we won, a, we won two league titles in three years. And we, we, we won the FA Cup and we, we were like named like Cup Kings. And it was a very special time. And we, uh, Ryan's, Ryan rightly says we don't have to go back to those days, but we do have to find a fine balance. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder, would it be worth just kind of, you know, getting rid of all the uncertainty and all these up in the air things and seeing what would happen if we start fresh? Because if you look at Liverpool and things like that, and all, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, I don't really have a... Th- sort of recall hearing them in controversial headlines I don't really recall hearing Man City and you know is this player doing that and is he going to leave the worst you sort of get is Leroy Leroy Sane going to leave and even then there's no real sort of drama Um, so I feel like we yeah we could do with rebuilding with that you know know, core core backbone do you know what it is Lou it's not even talent it's discipline Mm. yeah and I think that's just what Arsenal's probably lost and it probably doesn't help, does it, changing managers and identities and no. starting lineups and no. you know every, you've got to start from scratch over and over and over again, kind of thing. And each manager, I'm assuming, has got an idea of what they want to bring to the table and what type of players yeah. and what they can get out of who they've got in their system. I'm sure Arteta probably doesn't feel like he's going to get that high intensity pressing out of Mesut Ozil, is he? No, no. just just bad decisions, even at boardroom level, because you know even. You know, paying Mesut Ozil 350 grand a week, you know, mm. that's a ridiculous decision. I mean, Ivan Gazidis, I, I don't know how he managed to get the AC Milan job. I mean, just ridiculous business. And um, even but even bidding 40 million and a pound for Luis Suarez a few years ago, mm. ridiculous. Not, absolutely, yeah, it's just it's just really amateurish. And you know, it's no wonder that you know City, Liverpool, you know, they're they're all aligned and they've got the right people and the right jobs. Mm. Um, and if you don't have that, then even uh, even if, say, Jurgen Klopp or Pep Guardiola, Guardiola was in charge now, I think they'd, they'd struggle to, you know, they, they wouldn't win the league with Arsenal. I'll tell you that much. Even they'd struggle and, at times. And I think both of those clubs you mentioned, Bill, a great point is both have a leader and a centre-back. Man City had Vinnie Company and Liverpool had, had Van Dijk. They're sort of throwbacks, aren't they? Their throwbacks to that old sort of alpha dominant defender, like a leader, you could see they want it. I, I feel like we've just never, we've never got that, you know, because uh, I'm sure if you're a Bamiang and Pepe and Lacazette and you look behind you and you've got all these world class, rock solid defenders, you'll probably feel a lot more confident about your job than, <laughs> you know, you kind of think you're, you're doing everyone's job. No, I agree as well. I think to to elaborate on what Bill says about Gazidis, the thing that upset me with the Ozil um, contract was the ex- the explanation. It was signed and sealed, and then they came out in a press conference and said that um, the reason why he's been offered an extension is that um, it will cost us more to replace him, which I couldn't believe my ears when we've got a player on a, and. A, uh, obscene amount of money a week who scored one goal this season one goal one an attacking midfielder and then you get you get younger people saying oh but he's won the World Cup oh he was great for Real Madrid what about the here and now you'd think that your best attacking midfielder would uh, would score more than one goal and then the explanation of uh, oh it would cost us more to replace him Leicester won the league in 2016 with the likes of Mark Albrighton, who is an excellent player, uh, Jamie Vardy, Wes Morgan, but with organisation, fight and determination. And um, so it can be done, but it's, 
it's, obviously things have to fall into place. And I just think that it was an oversight. And I will support every single Arsenal manager, like I've always done in my 30 plus years of supporting the club. But the, what does worry me is I respect, um, I respect Ryan's comments about Ateta will eventually be a good manager. But at the moment, he has no, no experience to fall back on. I mean, I'll give you an example. I went, my last Arsenal match live was at the Emirates for the 1-1 draw against Sheffield United back in January. We were winning the game, but we didn't look entirely convincing. Chris Wilder made three substitutions, including Callum Robinson, who came through the youth setup at Aston Villa. And every substitution that Wilder made gave Sheffield United that little bit more impact to go on to get something out of the game. And Arteta had no answer. And you saw on Wednesday night, yes, the golfing class is massive in terms of personnel, but again, he has no answer. And I will support him like I've done every single Arsenal manager, but he's got to learn quickly. I mean, I remember speaking to Danny Cowley when he was at Lincoln. And I remember something he said to me, he said, continuity is so rare in football, James. He said, in the longer that you stay at a club, you know exactly what you need in terms of positions, in terms of personnel, in terms of building to improve a team. And I just hope that Arteta can learn quickly because to start out in your managerial career at one of the biggest clubs in England is a big ask. I mean, most most. People start out as an assistant here in the Netherlands and then go their own way and become a manager in their own right. But it's simply not a case of picking 16 names on a team sheet and sending them out across the white line. It's taking responsibility for an entire squad, for a, um, a mentality, for um, an opportunity to grow the club. And he's got to learn very, very quickly. I think very good points there, James, and he does need to adapt. You know, I don't think he's going to have... We, we don't live in an era now where you're going to get given 25 years at a club, mm. you know. Um, I think it's different. I think Arsenal need to be a bit more patient and give him a couple more years. But I also think, don't get me wrong, I want Arsenal to do the best they can. But if they don't qualify for Europe, I think that would be a blessing for us. And I think mm. that's what Arteta needs. Um I don't know if you guys agree with that, but I just think if we had more, if we was focused more on the league and maybe the FA Cup, for example, that could, you know, just that will give him time to reshape rather than having to play these Europa League games every week. And mm. that's my opinion. I, I think it's more damage now to qualify for the Europa League. Mm. No, I, I agree. And I think the fans and players... Have taken have taken European competition for granted. I mean, I've been at, I've been at many European games through the the previous years. I remember Monaco at home losing three one. I remember before I went into the turnstile when there was a guy behind me who said, "Oh, we'll win four 0 tonight." And I turned round to him. I said, "You do know they topped a group with Benfica, Bayer Leverkusen, and Zenit St Petersburg." I said, "I hope I, I hope we'll win, but we're certainly not going to win four 0 And we lost. Um, we lost 3-1. Ostersons at home. Uh, we were losing 2-0 and it was looking precarious and we managed to get over the line. And I, I spoke to Graham Potter shortly after that match and he said something really interesting. He said, uh, we knew that Arsenal was going to be really down and really upset with the Derby defeat. And we knew we, we could kind of apply a bit of pressure. And he did. And he almost got them over the line. And particularly with the Europa League last season, Ren, for example, they are going places. They are a club that are really going places. We, we've done well to get over the line, but we were lucky at times. And, and I remember before the draw was made, people were like, oh, who are they? We'll beat them. Some people have a distaste to the Europa League, but we reached the European final for the first time in 13 years. And I think Ryan makes a great point. If we come out of Europe and people understand what it means to be in it and what it means to play in it, the next time we get back in it, maybe we can make a little bit more of a positive impression. Well then, guys, to, to finish off then, um, Alan, will it be before Arsenal are successful again? Um, start with myself then. Um, I think in terms of being a good cup side, I think we can be successful within the next couple of years um, and challenging for the top four in the next maybe two, three, straight three. In terms of, you know, really being a success and being the Arsenal that we love challenging for the title, 
Um, I think it's over five years away. What about you, Lou? Uh, yeah, I was going to say about five years. I really do think so, because I think we need a lot of rebuilding to be done. And I think the most important thing, like James was saying earlier, is that consistency, obviously. So we need to give, if Arteta is our manager, give him as much time as you can to sort of set things up and so we can actually build on something rather than a couple of years and losing it all. And obviously, we've just got to factor in if City and Liverpool just keep getting better. Because yeah, we're obviously trying to close the gap, but they can just still keep improving as well. So, um, yeah, I, I really do think it'll be five years and we just need a lot of consistency before we can start challenging again. And you, James? I reckon five to seven. I reckon five to seven, but only if we learn from our mistakes. We've got an opportunity now going forward after this season and also for the remainder of this season to learn from our mistakes. When we delve into the transfer market, treat that money as if it's your own. Don't go wasting it. Check, check and check again. Check about an injury record. Check about a character. See what's gone before. Speak to managers that, have, that players have played under. Look at old tapes of what they've done at previous clubs. Just take, we, if we take our time, we can get it right. But fans have to be patient as well. There is no quick fix. There is no quick fix. You know, you've got 11 against 11. You've got so many different facets. And with the um, technology involved in football now and, and the resources that clubs have, um, I believe it will be five to seven. But it could be quicker, but we've got to learn quickly from our mistakes and just, uh, just be, excuse the pun, but right on the money before handing over and securing any services of any players. Right, well, uh, thanks, thanks for that, guys. Um, all right, well, thank you for, for watching. Um, if you are new to our channel, please subscribe to us. Um, if you like this video, give it a big thumbs up um, and let us know your, your comments in the, in the comments below. Um, we'd love to read those. Um, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.